Well, like generally when you hear England, you think of like, well, we'd say like a posh or fancy Southern England accent, like Queen's English, like banana on the grass and like it's really drawn out with hard A's and stuff. Our mission's not really like that. You've got Liverpool, which I can't even really do the accent, but it's like Shechen and all sorts of things like that, where in Manchester, it's not so much like that. It's like, I'm from Manchester, me. And they use a lot of like slang, like they say mate, like in Australian. A lot of the lingo is like rubbish. It's not a trunk or like the hood of a car. It's the boot and the bonnet. A lot of different words that it just takes time, but you're going to have to learn. And as well, like one of the hardest adjustments missionaries have in the mission is that we have like extra dignified language where generally we don't say words like cool, guy, or awesome. We don't say crap because that, that'll offend English people. Tip for when you go over there. You know, if you're ever going to do peace sign, do this, because this is flipping people off in England. So that's something, I, I my photo album full of pictures like this and stuff with my friends, yeah, I had to change those pictures because it's offensive and no one told, tells you that when you go out. So that's just something you need to know. But basically, depending on where you serve will be the accent. Like Stoke-on-Trent, which is like the Newcastle zone in the south, their accent is completely different to Carlisle. Carlisle is like a mix of Cumbrian and Scottish, which just is confusing. And in Wales, they have a Welsh accent, or they speak Welsh. And it doesn't, so it really depends on where you go. It's completely different. There's a lot of different accents. It's one of the nice things about England, but confusing as well. For your first week, you might not even understand the people. So You'll hear a lot of like people be like, oh, cheers, and thanks for that. Like, cheers is just a way to say thank you. Oh, I'm trying to think what are like some proper proper is a not, like an adjective you use like oh that was proper good or thanks for like thanks for that proper meal things it's really strange how it's used but you just kind of pick it up and over time you go with it from the top of my head I can't think of any like expressions or whatever that we'd use all the time but brilliant that's one it always be like oh brilliant things like that it's just different adjectives and way of describing things and when you get there you'll get a big binder and in the front of the binder there's like three pages of different words like what you're used to saying in England or what you're used to saying from I guess you'd say American there are a lot of Americans in the mission or whatever to English and so it all depends on where you learned English or if you're learning English it just helps you to know what to say in England so the English people they're really proud and so like quite often you'll joke around with them about just history and things like that at one point they ruled the world now they really don't and things like that so you get to have a lot of fun conversations with them about that but they're proud of their like heritage where they've come from and a lot of what they're doing so that's definitely something you can only strike a conversation about they like to talk about the weather and generally complain about it but it rains every day so it's really easy just like oh it's raining again and instant conversation on a bus and you can just go from there in england i'd say the culture it it's got a huge Christian background, but it's slowly starting to go to the wayside. A lot of Catholic and Church of England influence, but they've been fighting over all the centuries. And now the youth of today in England, I would say, generally aren't very religious. They're kind of going downhill and they need a lot of help. And so they're the people that will talk to you the most are young adults. But quite often you really have to work with them to get their interest and to help them to see where they can go. But... I would say that's one of the biggest groups that ends up getting baptized in the mission is like young single adults and then families as well. We find quite a few of them. They won't call it dinner time or supper or whatever other American terms use. It's called tea. So if you get there and your trainer's like, all right, we got a tea appointment at five o'clock. You're not going to break the word of wisdom. Don't worry. Tea just means dinner. And so you'll go somewhere and have tea. You'll just eat dinner. That's that was that's one of the most asked questions out there. I think, right, is it OK if we go to tea? Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry. One advice I would give you is, I don't know, YouTube some like ideas on how to have proper etiquette. Because when I hit the MTC, one of my good friends, his name was Elder Bruder, or Hustis, he, he watched all of us Americans sitting there eating away and stuff. And he's like, I'm not letting you go into Europe eating like that. So he sat there and he's like, all right, you hold the knife in this hand, you hold your, or you hold the fork in this hand, the knife in this hand. And he taught us how to eat properly. And most members are pretty relaxed and don't care. But if you're in investigators' homes or in members that are a bit more traditional you need to know how to eat properly and it's actually pretty effective so that's something i do is like learn how to eat the british style there's probably youtube videos i'm sure about it so look it up figure it out but that's something that could save you a lot of time and a lot of white shirts because at first i couldn't even like hit my mouth with my left hand so i got lasagna all over my white shirt it was, it was a mess so that's something you could do a lot of them just kind of fall under being a missionary, being dignified, and so like shake people's hands, be courteous, be on time, definitely be on time. But for the most part, English people are 
pretty laid back. You're not really going to offend them easily. Just be polite. Use appropriate language. If you're if you're using dignified language, you're never going to have a problem offending people. And so just keep that in mind. Generally take your shoes off when you go in their home and just be polite in general. There's not anything in particular that will really offend them or upset them that I can think of. So when I lived in Welling, um, that was the, the most central I got in the city. I was um, living on the banks of the Thames. Um, when we went jogging in the mornings, we would go and we'd jog along the River Thames and watch the, the boats pass by, um, passing off the docks, and we could see the bridges off in the distance. Um, London was um, a great experience uh, of my mission. Um, Something about being in London South is the, everything north of the river is kind of where they have more of the, uh, the posh areas, the areas where foreign dignitaries live and Kensington, which is the most uh, expensive postal code in the, in the country, as well as most of the places where tourists go to visit. Um, south of the Thames is a lot more um, housing. It's where people live that then commute north to go um, work um, in the city. And so it was great to live south of the river because instead of um, dealing with tourists often, we were always dealing with people that lived there and worked there. Um, I think Welling was probably where I experienced the most of the diversity that exists among the, the people that live in the UK. Um, a typical day was after we'd, we'd wake up and we'd do all our studies and we'd leave our flat and we'd walk out and the first person I talked to would be from Brazil, the person after that would be from Sri Lanka, the person after that would be from Spain, the person after that would be from Poland, the person after that would be from the States, the person after that would be from Mexico. Um, and this was how it was anytime I was in London. Um, so every place I went, I would be meeting people from all over the world. Um, and. It was fun to, to get to know all the different cultures and to get to know um, different people's habits and beliefs and to try foods from all over the world. Um, <laughs> once you, you serve in London, um, you'll eat something called fufu, which is a, an African dish. Um, it's basically uh, <laughs> it's like bread cement that you dip in soup and you eat and it just keeps you so full. Um, and I learned on my mission how to how to meet and greet um, in I think 14 or 15 different languages, um, which is something I found to be really helpful among the people because it was an incredible icebreaker. Um, I would meet someone from Ghana, and as soon as I would realize that they were from Ghana, um, I would ask them where they were from, and if they were from an area that spoke Twi, I would be like, "Oh, I to say, well, who to send?" And they would be so happy to meet someone that spoke their language that they would stop and they would talk. Um, and I did the same for, for many other uh, cultures and um, different uh, ethnicities and languages. Um, when you live in London, it's all about buses as well. Um, the entire mission, um, when I left, there was only eight cars that full-time young missionaries would use. The rest were used by um, senior couples. Um, the entire mission I spent walking. Um, walking and busing is basically the way you get around in London South. Um, and so some areas like Farnborough, it would be just one single bus route that we get a bus pass on. But in London itself, you get an Oyster card, which is a, a pass that you can just tap on to any bus any underground system and, and most trains as well. And so anytime we wanted to get anywhere, we would jump on the bus. So one of the first things we would do as soon as you got into an area was look at the maps and try to memorize all the bus routes because it's key to know <laughs> which buses get you where quickly. And while we're on the note of buses, buses became one of my favorite proselyting experiences as well. Well, sometimes um, you get on a bus and all you want to do is just rest because you're so, so, so tired of walking and, and talking. Um, people on the buses are often, um, you know, tired too um, and are ready to, you know, any kind of distraction by talking to people next to them is very welcome. So I found it very effective to just jump on a bus and sit down next to someone and strike up a conversation. And 
it was a different kind of contact because instead of starting with um, the fact that I was a missionary, I was able to talk about them for a while and get to know them um, before inviting them to, to learn more about the church. Um, it was one of my favorite ways to meet people on my mission and very many, um, a lot of successes, a lot of teaching opportunities came out of that. Uh, South London is um, the most expensive mission that the church operates. Um, it's mostly because of rent is so expensive um, for London, but also because travel and, and um, food are very expensive in London. Um, the church gives you well enough money to, to handle housing and food and whatnot. As long as you're thrifty, you can make it through a month and um, eat well enough to be fine. As well as, um, depending on where you serve, members will feed you pretty well as well. Um, I never once had an experience on my mission where I felt unsafe. Um, there was never a time where I felt like I was in danger of being robbed or mugged um, in any way like that. Um, while there were occasional um, vague threats from you know young teenagers or something like that that just thought it'd be fun to poke fun at a, a holy man or something like that, it was far and few between. I, I can only think of maybe one specific instance where that happened. Um, that being said, there are areas that you need to avoid, um, but anyone in that um, in each area will let you know where those are. But even some of those areas that are supposed to be dangerous, I never once uh, felt unsafe in. You don't have to worry about your own rent. I know some missions, they have you take care of that and haggling prices and stuff like that but the mission office takes care of all rent and so you never have to once look at how much your rent costs. Um, so your two main expenses are transportation and um, food. And so they give you, um, when I was there, it may have changed now due to inflation, but it was about 120 pounds or so um, a month for food, which as I said was perfectly fine as long as you didn't eat out too much and you were smart in your shopping and were willing to cook, that was always well enough to, to live well. Um, especially if you and your companion combined your money together to, to buy your food. Um, transportation, depending on where you live, they give you the amount that you need for a bus pass. Um, in some cases, we would dip into our food money to buy train tickets would be because we usually have a little bit of that left over um, if it was more convenient or better or more time effective for us to take the trains every once in a while. But other than that, they would just give you the exact amount that you would need for uh, a monthly or weekly bus pass, which would then work on all the buses in your district. One thing I would say about preparation for serving in London is obviously it rains, so you have to have good rain gear. Um, a good enough, just buy an umbrella that's not too expensive, but that won't break easily because it's often windy while it's rainy. So if you have a cheap umbrella, it will unfold on you and will be annoying. Um, also, if you can get an umbrella that's compact, um, but not once again, not too cheap, um, it's very helpful because I tried to have my umbrella on me at all times because you never knew when it was going to start raining. Um, as far as clothes go, I'd actually recommend that you buy most of your mission clothes out there um, because, uh, frankly, British um, nice dress is nicer and cheaper than American stuff. And so something that some of my friends did that I thought was a good idea is if you just buy a suit and enough shirts to basically get you through the MTC and then save some of your money for when you get out there. Because um, I was able to buy a British suit, which was much nicer than my American suit for about, uh, the equivalent was about $70, um, while an American suit costs around like 160 or so. And also the shirts there I was able to get for five pounds each, which is roughly about $7. Um, ties as cheap as one pound, which is like $1.75. Um, so yeah, I'd recommend buying most of your clothes and gear and stuff out there. I served in like the center of Manchester for six months and I did a year when you add up the other thing just within the stake and that area. So Manchester is great. The, 
problem you run into a lot is that if you go knocking on game day when it's Manchester City playing or Manchester United, nobody will talk to you. But that's because soccer, football, don't don't say soccer. If you say football, football over there is huge. It's like, it's like a religion sometimes. So that can be difficult. But the people for the most part are super friendly. They're willing to talk to you. We do a lot of street contacting. So we talk to people out on the streets. We, go, we do knock doors quite a bit. You'll get to track your heart out. And it's just a privilege. Depending on what part of Manchester you're in depends what type of finding you'll do most and one of the areas that everyone wants to serve in is called the Manchester YSA ward and it's smack there's like a university here a university here and the church just spent I don't know how many million dollars to build a big five-story building right in the middle of it there's like four stories and then a basement and so that's like it has an institute and a lot of different things for YSA students to attract university students and to help those that are coming in to remain active and to make friends and things like that. And if you're there, there's a road right in front of it called Oxford Road. And the missionaries just spend almost every day just out street contacting and they set up displays and talk to all the university students coming by in almost a constant stream all year round. And so that's just one of the best areas. Kind of opposite of that, one of the areas I served in is called Hyde. And it's more of like a, a suburb of, it, of Manchester. And in England, houses are a little bit different than in America. They're very rarely detached. Almost every house is like two or three stories high, but they're really narrow, and they're all like just one big row of houses completely connected. And in Hyde, there's not as many people out on the streets to talk to and, and quite a few of the different areas. So what we'd spend our time doing is, is knocking doors a lot, or we'd be walking or busing to areas where there would be. I was privileged as well for a few months in Manchester, I had a car. So we would be able to get around quite a bit and we'd also be able to go see all the different areas. So we were able to work with missionaries in their area and things like that and really get a feel for the whole of the zone and the people are so friendly. That's one of the things I loved. Quite often you'll find though that the people that are most friendly aren't actually English. England is full of so many immigrants. The nicest people are Africans. Like it almost sounds cliche, but if we saw someone from Africa, we'd go straight, we'd V line toward them because we knew that they would talk to us and they're probably already Christian. A lot of the people in England grew up either Church of England or Catholic, and they're they're slowly starting to lose their faith, which was something we were working hard to try and like count on, build your faith and add some truth to it. But it was really good. So, so cost of living. My favorite store in the entire world is called Aldi, and or Aldi, depending on what part of England you're in. And it's German owned. It's all over Europe, and it's just a, a super cheap store that sells food at a discount. And so you're able to like really make the limited funds you have as a missionary go a lot farther shopping there. There's the Walmart equivalent over there. It's owned by Walmart. It's called Asda. So you can shop there. There's Tesco, a big grocery shop, but. It can be difficult sometimes because not they don't always provide bags. Like Aldi, you have to bring your own bags. And then you have to carry your bags all the way to the bus. And that's basically the main way of transportation. We generally don't ride bikes as much because we always have side bags and it's difficult. And taxis are really expensive and you can't, the church won't pay for those. So train tickets and bus tickets, the church will reimburse you for. And that's generally what you do no matter where you're at in the mission. Very few people have cars. So generally you train from one end to the other and train rides could be 20 minutes or they could be three or four hours depending on where you're going so it can be quite extensive for manchester itself it's pretty diverse as to what people do i'm not even exactly sure like a lot of everyone worked different jobs and did different things so it's just like your average city it's one of the most diverse cities though i would say is like when you get up piccadilly town center is one of the areas where you'll get to go quite often as a missionary and who knows what languages you're here being spoken or what's going on for shopping there's a couple different malls in england one's called the trafford center it's huge i only was able to go once on my mission but missionaries sometimes go there it's a bit out of our budget to be honest but there's a few other places to go but for the most part, Manchester is the center for activity. You'll get off at the main train, whenever you're coming in for meetings, generally you'll get off at the main train station called Piccadilly, and you'll walk to the bus station, which isn't far, and that'll either take you to an area called Withenshaw, which is kind of the rep for being ghetto, but that's where the stake center is, so you'll travel there, it's like a 40 minute bus ride, or you'll walk about 10 to 15 minutes to the YSA building, which is near kind of the center for everything. 
the weather I can definitely comment on. So you're, you're going to England. You should know what to expect by now. You need a good rain jacket. In the winter, it gets dark. I was in Scotland for my, or up near Scotland in Carlisle for my first winter. It got dark at like three o'clock and it rained almost every day. So you're just saying like, there's sunshine in my soul today and you go out and you work because it's all there really is to do. It gets dark early, the people get really grouchy, and you just love it. Like, the amount of time, like, the fond memories I had tracking in the rain now are just priceless. You don't think so at the time. At the time, you're like, I'm freezing, somebody just let me in, and they generally, they don't, but you still love it. And sometimes they do, and that's one of the nice things, but it's great. In the summer, though, it doesn't get dark until, like, 11 o'clock at night, and even though it is England and it still does rain a lot, it's generally you get sunshine. I mean, you're not really going to get a tan because you're a missionary, but you'll have like that hideous farmer's tan or like and things like that. And you'll have one from your collar, but you'll love it. Even though the weather can be hard sometimes, you just you go out, get some gloves. Get I would really recommend the shoes you buy be like waterproof. Find some Echoes or something with Gore-Tex because you're going to need it.